In this video, we're going to learn how to determine whether a chemical reaction is spontaneous by using the second law. Alright, so uh, our task at hand is to determine whether the combustion of methane, which I'm going to write right here, uh, is spontaneous. Alright, so methane, under ambient conditions, can be burned with molecular oxygen to generate CO2 and water which will be in the liquid phase at ambient conditions of 298.15 Kelvin in one bar of pressure. And our question is whether this reaction is spontaneous, right? So, so whether the reaction will just happen naturally or whether you have to do something, you have to apply some work in order to make it happen. All right, so to do that, we have to uh, apply here the second law, right? Uh, that is our criterion of spontaneity which says that uh, you actually have to calculate the change in entropy in the universe for that chemical reaction. And if that is positive, then uh, we will be able to say that the reaction is spontaneous. If it's negative, then we will see that the reaction is not as spontaneous as written. Uh, instead, it will be spontaneous in the reverse direction. And then if it's zero, we will say that that, that our reaction is at equilibrium. Okay, so uh, the definition of the entropy of the universe is just the sum of the change in entropy in the system and the surroundings. Right, so there's two calculations that we have to do here. First, calculate the change in entropy in the system, which is the chemical reaction, and then calculate the change in entropy in the surroundings. So let's uh, get started with uh, the system, which will be our first topic here. Change in entropy in the system. Now, we're going to do this on a per mole basis. So all of the units of our answers would be joules per mole per Kelvin. Okay, so we're assuming a mole of reaction here. All right, so to calculate the change uh, in entropy in a chemical reaction, uh, we simply have uh, to just take the entropies of products minus reagents. Okay, and now uh, here we have a table in which all of the absolute molar entropies of the reagent product species are listed, so we can just take them directly. Okay, so, um, uh, well, I'm actually gonna write here uh, uh, how to do this calculation, and then uh, we'll take the numbers and actually uh, calculate it explicitly. All right, so we take uh, the absolute molar entropy of products minus reagents, so that would be the molar entropy of CO2, which is a gas, plus the molar entropy of uh, water, which is a liquid, uh, multiplied by two, because that's the stoichiometric coefficient, and then minus the absolute molar entropy of reagents, which would be methane, minus uh, oxygen. Okay, so that would be the molar entropy of methane, CH4 gas, uh, and then twice the molar entropy of oxygen, which is a gas. All right, so again, what, I what you would do here is just take uh, these absolute molar entropies that you have right there and combine them, as we have right here, to obtain a value of uh, the entropy of the reaction uh, uh, whose sign we can predict. Okay, again, remember that predicting the sign of changes in entropy is relatively straightforward. Here, clearly, we can see that uh, if we tally up the numbers of moles and reagents on products, we'll have three moles in reagents and then one more in product. Uh, so that means that you're losing gas. And because gases are uh, far more entropic than liquids and solids, then very likely you should have here a decrease in entropy, which means that the sign of your cal calculator here should be negative. When you actually uh, punch in the numbers in your calculator, you will get that this number actually is 242 uh, joules per mole Kelvin. All right, so uh, uh, this is just one of the pieces of uh, the answer, right? With this number alone, we cannot conclude whether this reaction would be spontaneous or not. And again, that's because the criterion for spontaneity requires the uh, change in entropy in the universe. And the only thing that we've done here is calculated the change in entropy in the system. All right, so let's go with the second piece, which will be the change in entropy of the surroundings. All right, so uh, the change in entropy of the surroundings uh, has uh, a common expression, right? So this is always equal to the heat in the surroundings divided over the temperature, which in this case is 298.15. Uh, but of course, we always refer the surroundings to the system uh, to do the actual calculation over T. So that is the heat evolved uh, uh, in the system in reality. And in reality, this is a chemical reaction that is uh, isothermal and isobaric. 
And uh, the isobaric uh, condition is important here because if you're at constant pressure, then heat is equal to a change in enthalpy, right? So what we can write here is that this is simply going to be uh, the change in enthalpy in the reaction, which we know how to calculate, divided over the temperature. Okay, so well, how do we calculate the change in entropy? Well, uh, for chemical reactions, the change in entropy in a chemical reaction will be the enthalpy of formation of products minus the enthalpy of formation of reagents. Right, so notice that the equation is going to be very similar to what we've done for entropy, but now these are enthalpies, and you'll have to take enthalpies of formation, which are the data that we uh, normally use when we're trying to estimate or, or to determine the enthalpies of substances. Right, so uh, again, taking a uh, cue from what we have there, so that, that will be the enthalpies of formation of products uh, minus those of reagents, multiplied by the stoichiometric coefficients. So twice the enthalpy of formation of uh, water, which is a liquid, and these are more standard quantities, always more standard, that's how you uh, always get data in tables, minus uh, the standard molar enthalpy, so formation of reagents, which will be uh, methane, which is a gas, and then uh, two times the standard molar enthalpy of formation of oxygen, which is a gas parenthesis, and all these data are in table. Notice that uh, oxygen here, molecular oxygen, is the most stable allotrope of oxygen, so by definition the enthalpy of formation is zero, that is that, and again the, the rest of data you always have in tables, right? So you will take that number for methane, and then the uh, corresponding numbers for water and CO2. Anyways, when you uh, carry out that calculation, you get that this reaction is very exothermic, as you would expect. Notice that uh, methane is the most abundant species of natural gas, and the combustion of natural gas is something that we use very heavily in our economy and in our households uh, uh, to warm ourselves and to actually produce uh, electricity. Right? So you expect this to be uh, quite exothermic so that uh, we can uh, extract work from this. And uh, it is exothermic, so it's minus 890.3 kilojoules per mole. Okay. So we actually have now the enthalpy of the reaction, uh, and we're almost ready to calculate what the change in entropy in the surrounding should be. You can also anticipate, anticipate what the sign of this change in entropy in the surrounding should be. Okay, notice that the reaction is heavily exothermic, and what that means is that there's a lot of energy being transferred or dumped into the surroundings as heat. So what the surroundings are going to do is uh, they're going to try to dissipate this energy and that is going to lead to uh, an increase in the entropy. Okay, so, so what this should be, well, the, the, the sign that should come out of this should be actually positive, right? That should lead to, a, to a quite an increase in entropy in the surroundings because again, you're just dumping a lot of energy into them. All right, so we got here that negative sign and then the temperature is 298.15 uh, Kelvin. And then we just take the enthalpy of the reaction, which is uh, minus 890. 0.3 times 10 to the 3 joules per mole. I've already done the kilojoules to joule transformation because soon I'm going to have to add the enthalpy of the system to the enthalpy of the surroundings and the enthalpy of the system is in joules per mole Kelvin. So I'm setting myself up here to get the units in joules per mole Kelvin. Okay, so uh, when you uh, carry out that calculation, the number that comes out of this is plus uh, 200 or 2,986 joules per mole Kelvin, right? A huge gain in entropy in the surroundings because, again, there's a lot of energy being deposited by this very exothermic reaction into the surroundings. All right, so we actually have uh, uh, both pieces of the puzzle that we need here to calculate the change in entropy in the universe, which is what determines whether the reaction is spontaneous, right? So if we uh, erase now all of these calculations right here and just uh, retain uh, the values for the system, which is this one, and the surroundings, which is that one, uh, we can then finally calculate the change in entropy in the universe. And uh, that will be minus 242 joules per mole Kelvin plus 2986 joules per mole Kelvin. So overall, uh, the change in entropy in the universe 
uh, that you get out of this is going to be uh, 27, 44 joules per mole Kelvin plus 2744 joules per mole Kelvin. So, the important thing here is that that sign is positive. And with that, you can uh, conclude uh, forcefully that this reaction will be spontaneous. Now, there's a caveat with thermodynamics and the prediction of spontaneity. And that is that uh, the second law only tells you the reaction will be spontaneous as written. Okay, but it doesn't tell you how fast the reaction is. As a matter of fact, if you actually mix methane gas with oxygen gas at ambient conditions, 298 Kelvin and 1 bar of pressure, then actually the reaction is very slow and you don't see it combust. You can actually, uh, we have a little bit of methane in our atmosphere, there's certainly plenty of oxygen, and you don't see the methane burning, right? Uh, you actually, the reaction is slow enough that if you want to make it happen, you need to initiate it by yes, uh, using a flame or heating it up, things like that. Right, so that is a caveat of thermodynamics, again, that, that even though the reaction is spontaneous, uh, we don't know if the reaction actually happens at an appreciable rate. That is the body of kinetics, which, which thermodynamics knows nothing about. Okay, so again, the prediction is only that the reaction should happen, not how quickly it will happen. Okay, so in this video, we just have learned how to calculate the spontaneity of a chemical reaction using the second law.